Hear that? Believe it or not, summer is just around the corner. Luckily, Armorall, America's most trusted auto appearance brand, has what your car needs to get that perfect summer shine. Plus, now through May 31st, we'll give you $5 for every $20 you spend on Armorall products. That means car wash pods, protectant, tire shine, you name it. Find out how to get your $5 rebate at Armorall.com. Armorall, less work, more clean. Terms apply. This week on Unforgotten. Stephen Ryan King's story begins on December 2nd in 1983 in the close-knit community of Alpine, Alabama. His mother, Tina, met John Lowe a robust entrepreneur who cleared land for a living. The two eventually married, blending their families and forming an unbreakable bond. On November 30th, Ryan got off work at the Honda plant and went to John and Tina's over on Oakdale Road. The first deputy on the scene discovered a harrowing sight. Both Ryan and John lying on the ground, both suffering from gunshot wounds. A new witness came forward claiming to have seen a light-skinned black male near the scene shortly before the murder. I would ask that they turn themselves in the, and think of the family and the pain and the suffering that they have. Do the right thing. Turn yourself in. Hey, everyone. This is Sellers. And this is Stormy. And, and this, this is Unforgotten. Unforgotten. Where each episode will highlight unsolved missing, murdered, and suspicious death cases in Alabama in order to raise awareness and hopefully obtain some answers for victims and their families. Please remember that any individual referenced in the podcast should be considered innocent until found guilty in a court of law, and any opinions or views expressed in the podcast are solely those of participants. Listener discretion is advised as some of the content discussed in the podcast may contain violence or graphic descriptions and may not be suitable for all audiences. And now for Unforgotten Episode 39, Ryan King and John Lowe. Hey guys, and welcome back. Hey there, sellers. Hey there. How you been? (laughs) Doing all right, you know. How's the weather? We are not having much good weather hmm. <laughs> this week. I only asked I mean, like last we've had we some, so I try not to complain because it was kind of nice, you know, up until a few days back and then it started raining. But we had like two nights this week uh, that were like in the 30s and 40s. And today is like the first day this week. It hasn't rained, but it's it was supposed to go up to sixty seven, and I think it barely made it to sixty. So, <laughs> wow! I know. I don't know what the heck is going on with that. But you guys, man, like the South. Well, you probably aren't getting it as bad now. But like, God, did sh- did you see Texas? Did you? I don't know if you've been no. watching. The, you haven't been watching the weather, have you? No. <laughs> I, I should know better than to ask you that. <laughs> I know. You know, you have to text me when things are even going on here. Um, so no, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I know that normally when there's bad weather in Texas, it moves this way. Yeah. Well, gosh, I they are now calling all the storms down in the Midwest and the South like historic storm weather. Because oh, it's gotten so bad. That's, in, that's encouraging. Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully it won't make it to you guys. <laughs> yeah, let's hope. It's been um pretty warm, actually. Like, pretty warm. Yeah. Well, that's lucky for you. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. We're not in those in those thirties and forties anymore. Yeah. So, well, it's about that time where you really just don't go go back to that for quite a long while now, right? We are entering summer. <laughs> yeah. The long six month summer. <laughs> yes. Yes. We won't get cold weather again until next February. Yeah. Um, you know. Um, but I was asking about it. It seems like such a like cliche question to ask. But the last time we were talking, you were talking about like how you geek out over the weather thing. So I was like, oh, yeah. I'm totally asking about it. Yep. Yep. I have been. I've been watching Max, man. He's right on it. It's pretty cool. I've been watching a lot of the the videos too. The one in there was one in Iowa that was really bad. I think it was day before yesterday. Yeah. And it was like 
the, the, these people got like drone coverage of it. So it was following. And there's like one like storm chaser that's like really well known in the circles, I guess. I mean, I even know his name and I don't even really watch it that much. Um, but anyway, he would, they were like writing right alongside of it. And, but it, it looked like it had like a bunch of tendrils spiral, spiraling, spiraling around in, in the funnel, in the big funnel. But no was, sharknadoes. No sharknadoes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh my well, heavens. That would be scary. Uh, but yeah. I always think of Storm Chasers like, um, Twister. Yeah. Yeah, like that is really fun to watch. I mean, I know it's scary for the people that are involved, and that's you know that's really the bad part of it. But there are some fascinating; <laughs> they're fascinating people, and what they're doing is fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Um. Oh, so we don't talk a lot, like a whole whole lot, about like our personal lives outside of this, you know. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people probably don't know that, like. In my before life, I was a paralegal and, yeah. um, you know, life happened and I took a little bit of a break. So I just went back to my, my second home. I started back this week and I'm super excited about being yeah. back. Yeah. It sounds and like they're excited to have you back. They're at least pretending. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think they are. I think they were just as happy to see me as I was them. Good. Maybe not quite as much because um, I was incredibly happy. Um, But man, it has been a change. Like having to get up in the mornings and actually get dressed and be presentable. Oh, (laughs) yes. The real pants thing. Like, I'm not going to lie. Like after the first day, I was like, ooh. What was I thinking? Am I going to be able to do this? And then I came home that afternoon and basically passed out. (laughs) Yeah, I bet. This was a long day. Yeah. I mean, like I was kind of mentioning to you, after being so long working out of the home, that's got to be almost like a little bit of overstimulation with all the people around you. It, oh, it is. Because (laughs) there's like, you go from not being around anybody to a, a lot of anybody's, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's yeah. A lot. And there's yeah, just, it's crazy. There's a lot of other just external stressors going on. I'm actually like um, having like a, I guess, anxiety reaction. So I've got these like, um, my hands break out when oh, I yeah. get like super stressed or anxiety kicks in and it's like almost like poison ivy type thing and it itches so bad. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, my body is not adjusting well. Yeah. But uh-huh. it's going to all smooth out. Yeah, for sure. Once I get my like, you know, what is that called? Your clock. The what? Your clock. Like, you oh. know, when you're you're like sleeping, like you're. Yeah. Uh, I there's a word for uh, it. I yeah. It is, though. <laughs> Once I get that all normalized, but it was kind of bad timing for me. Actually, it was great timing in all reality, but like bad timing for me thinking about it because like my kid just got out for summer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like I don't even have to be. Up to it's like you start new jobs in the fall, not in the summer. <laughs> I know, but I'm excited to be back in trial stuff and um. I'm just happy to be back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it'll be uh, exciting. I know you can't yeah. share d- details like a cases, but it'll be interesting yeah. to hear all about things as you go along. So. I know. I'm I'm super excited about it. So yeah. and I'll probably be picking their brains about things. Yeah. I already <laughs> sent one of the guys uh the podcast. I was like, hey. Check it out. I was looking at the stats and I was like, oh, hey, you do mention that they wanted to listen to a Brittany Wood one and suggested ours. And I just saw, like, I think you said that yesterday and there was mm-hmm. listens yesterday on Oh, case, cool. like, hey. So, how about so that? I think they did. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty um, cool. Anyone interested who hasn't actually listened to our very first um, episodes? 
of Two Unforgotten. Yep. Our, not only is our two-year anniversary for ACCA coming up, but our very first On episodes of her coming. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, go listen. Because is even though it's the very first ones, I think we did a pretty good job. I know it's kind of um, bizarre going back and listening to it because there's been a lot of growth since those first few episodes. Yeah, yeah, so, a lot of change. And sometimes we kind of revert back to some of the things we did then, but mostly we, we do things a little yeah, bit differently. I think it's gotten a little better. Yeah. Well, by the time this comes out, we'll have passed the deadline for voting in the nappy. So yeah. I did just want to go ahead and say thank you to everybody who voted. We won't know yeah. anything about results until I think July. July. 17th. I can't even believe birthday. it. <laughs> and it feels like a long wait, but we I know everybody who logged in and voted. I know. A lot. I'm thinking like, I need to find a way to get like some contributions then just come down there for your birthday. And then if we won, then I have, I get to go to the gala. Oh thing. yeah. <laughs> that would be awesome. That would be awesome. Uh, yeah. So, uh, anybody want to contribute to the birthday fund? <laughs> <laughs> send send Stormy to Seller's birthday. <laughs> yeah. Kidding. Start a GoFundMe. Mm-hmm. Oh, and the T-shirt. The deadline for names on the T-shirt will have passed by this time too. So hopefully, exactly. we'll have a T-shirt going pretty soon, yep. and you guys will. Yep, have for the all updated design. Yeah. Um, also, don't forget that on June 22nd, Vocal is doing their Voices for Victims run in Montgomery. Yes. So there is still yes. time to register for that. Mm-hmm. I've been slacking on my daily training. Yeah, well, you've been a little busy. I'm going to uh, be crawling. Like uh, I said. So I'm going to be it is not for lack of reminders because my app reminds me every day you have not done this. Yeah. <laughs> I see you, but I'm just going to swipe you off the screen and pretend like I didn't. Um, I've just been too tired, but I'm going to. I'm going to get back onto it. I've got time. But if I don't get on it, I won't have time. That's how that's going to work. Also, by the time this comes out, man, this feels like a whole bunch of delayed announcements. Um, There will have been a vigil for missing persons that's happening in Montgomery. Um. This weekend, actually. Well, I guess it'll be the weekend before this comes out. Yep. And I'm actually going up to meet Tillis. I'm so jealous you get to do that. Yeah. I'm going to go meet Tillis, uh, George James's mom, um, Friday. I'm not sure that I'll be there before the vigil actually happens on Friday, but I think Vocal actually has something planned on Saturday. But they're going to do a rally at the train station, I think. So we're going to go to that and then... Vocal has something planned for Saturday that Tillis, Saturday evening or afternoon that Tillis found. So I think we're going to go do that. And so we're just going to kind of hang out and kind of make the rounds. Do all the things. It's like, you know what you need to do? You need to look, just start putting me on like FaceTime everywhere you go. <laughs> True story. Like I'm, I'll, I'll even dress up and like I'm there. I gotta live my curious. You just have to text me and remind me because my, you know, how my brain like bounces. No. Around and then I'm like, oh wait, I was supposed to do that. Sorry, I already uh, left. And it's like you just like get one of those things that you hook your phone to that you can put like a necklace around your neck and <laughs> put me there so I can just see hmm. everything that you're doing. You yeah. just kind of like a almost like a body cam. <laughs> oh, that, it'd be a good time to try that because I said I was going to need it for the run. Yeah. So, so today's case is taking us to Talladega County in eastern central Alabama, just a hop, skip, and a jump east from last week's case in Pill City. Talladega County offers quite a range of outdoor recreation, but it's probably best known, at least in pop culture, probably best known for the Talladega Super Speedway and the Grand Prix Raceways, where enthusiasts spend their time cheering for, or indulging in, the need for speed. Well, for those on the other end of the spectrum, the county boasts of several golf courses, such as Cider Ridge. Um, and just I, when I went to look, I thought there was only a couple, but actually there's like six or eight of them. Notably, uh, in the whole golf world there, though, it is actually home to the first class 
3,200 acre golf course and resort um, called Purcell Farms Resort. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Um, It's pretty phenomenal. (laughs) It offers not just the course itself, which is huge, but it also has a sporting facility, a spa, hiking and bike trails. It has this thing, have John Deere, like... um, they call them UTVs. I call them ATVs out here, but UTV Mountain Experience is what it's called, where they go out and they ride these um, like side by sides and things mm-hmm. out in the mountains. Um, well, that's and just cool. a whole, yeah, yeah, just a whole array of things out there to do. I thought it was kind of interesting because it got its name in 1856. Um, this family called the Purcell family uh, started this fertilizer company. And so it was literally kind of a farmish kind of place. Um, and so it was the Silicaga Fertilizer National Fertilizer Development Center. That's a mouthful. Mm, it is. Um, very, Silicaga Fertilizer National Fertilizer Development Center. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not weird. That seems a bit redundant. I know. <laughs> I think it's like <laughs> Silicaga Fertilizer and then it's hyphen or Uh, something like like that, even though it doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyway, but they actually produced um, products like Polyon, which is the stay green fertilizer, which everybody, a bunch of people use. I thought stay green was kind of the um, spray paint for grass. Well, it was actually a fertilizer, but I think that they had a product at one time that was kind of like that. But it's what, like, especially golf courses used um, yeah. to make their lawns look so phenomenal. Um, and maybe I should get some for my Interesting. Grass. Yeah. Interestingly enough, um, they actually built a golf course and attracted people to the golf course as a selling pitch sort of thing. Um, well, that's so interesting. That was, it's a very yeah. target, um, targeted audience that they yeah, got there. Yeah, for sure. So eventually the fertilizer portion of their company was sold in 2016 to a Canadian company. But um, shortly after that, the resort was born. So Guess that we was, it sold for a pretty penny. I bet it did. Yeah. Yeah. So roughly 82,000 individuals call Talladega County home. And where our case research brings us today is a small, unincorporated community of Alpine, about 15 miles southwest of the county seat of Talladega. This is where roughly 4,600 residents and the couple, John and Tina Lowe, call home. It's also where Tina's son, Ryan King, was visiting on a humid November evening in 2015, where the events of our case today unfold. Stephen Ryan King's story begins on December 2nd in 1983 in the close-knit community of Alpine, Alabama. Born to Larry King and Tina Fields Lowe, Ryan quickly became known for his boundless generosity. His parents said he was the type of man who would give the shirt off his back to anyone in need. Hardworking and kind-hearted, Ryan's most cherished role was that of a devoted father. Well, what I would start off in describing him is, I mean, he was a very tender-hearted child growing up. I mean, he was very empathetic to other people's feelings, and uh, uh, that transpired up till whenever he become a man. I don't know what it was, but he got fulfillment just helping somebody out. He was working at uh, Honda, been working there for years. Oh, he loved to fish. He was big into fishing. When Ryan was about 12 years old, a new chapter began in his life. His mother, Tina, met John Lowe, a robust entrepreneur who cleared land for a living. The two eventually married, blending their families and forming an unbreakable bond. Ryan and John shared a mutual passion for racing, spending countless hours at car shows and NASCAR events. And their relationship was one of camaraderie and mutual respect, as reflected in the many photos Ryan proudly posted on his Facebook page snapshots of the happy days at the races with John and Ryan's young son. NASCAR was their thing, yes. But they loved it. They loved it. It was, uh, uh, Ern Art Jr. was their their man. Yeah. Mine was Gordon. Mine was Gordon. But, um, 
You know, they, they both loved Earnhardt Jr. And Ryan's son would go with them to the races. So it would be them three. I, I, I did that last race in October. Me, John, Ryan, Ryan's son, my daughter, Nikki, her husband, and their two children went. All of us went to that race in October. Every one of us. On December 22nd of 2004, Ryan married Trinity Sims, and their love story soon welcomed a beautiful addition, a baby boy, as we mentioned. Their happiness seemed boundless, and in 2010, they joyfully anticipated the arrival of a baby girl. However, tragedy struck in April of 2011 when Trinity experienced severe complications during her pregnancy. Despite the best medical efforts, both Trinity and their unborn daughter, Cadley Ryan, passed away, leaving Ryan heartbroken and to raise Kylan alone. Wife was, I think, she was like eight months pregnant. She was, she had already had her baby shower, and the baby's name was Cadley Ryan, R Y A N N. He had uh, tragedy in his life. He was married and uh, had one son, his wife and daughter on the way. And uh, he lost his wife about five years before his murder and uh, lost the baby and, and his wife. So he had uh, a, lot of, a lot of difficulty, a lot of pain in his life then. But he was still managing and, and working through it. Determined to provide a loving and stable wife for his son, Ryan began working at the Honda manufacturing plant starting around July of 2011. His social media profiles paint a vivid picture of a dedicated father. Photos of soccer matches, baseball games, and shared adventures fill his timeline. Every moment Ryan wasn't working was spent creating precious memories with his son. By 2015, Ryan had slowly began re-entering the dating scene. He began a relationship with a young woman, also a single parent, in the hope of rebuilding his life. However, this relationship ended in a disappointment. As I understand it, um, this is coming from a uh, third party, was that uh, they had been dating. Uh, they had went uh, Black Friday shopping for the kids and stuff. He, I think it was on that Saturday, uh, he had uh, made the statement that he loved her. Uh, then, uh, I think it was that Sunday, uh, she broke it off with him. I did, um, get a, uh, text, uh, that he had sent that, uh, basically said, you know, well, that didn't lo- last long. She just dumped me and kind of acted like, uh, he didn't really totally understand it. He just said that, uh, uh, he had, uh, told her that he had loved her and, That was it. The relationship kind of ended suddenly. Ryan thought everything was kind of going well. And when it turned out, maybe it wasn't going as well as what he thought it was. Um, He went to his mom and John's because, you know, we heard Larry and Tina talking earlier about Ryan and John kind of had this this bond between them because of these kind of shared interests and they really could talk about anything. And he was kind of just, I think maybe trying to get things off his chest, maybe understanding, um, confusion about like, you know, where did things go wrong? And Larry thought that maybe Ryan had also been maybe exchanging text messages with the girl he'd been dating trying to see if there was any way to possibly repair the relationship. You know, like, he didn't really know what caused the breakup, but maybe Ryan was trying to see if there was a way they could, you know, work things out. Mm -hmm. And I think he was hanging out with John, you know, trying to just get his mind off things. Right. And so Mm -hmm. that day, on November 30th, Ryan got off work at the Honda plant and... He normally got off, you know, around three-ish, I think, and went to John and Tina's. 
over on Oakdale Road. And that's kind of a rural area. Yeah, There's very houses nice. out there, but they're not houses that sit on top of each other. They're all sitting kind of on bigger pieces of property. Like when you pull up the Google aerial view, like they all have nice big areas. So you have neighbors, you can see the houses that are next to you, but you know, you can't just reach out and touch them. And Mm -hmm. so I think Ryan got there a little bit before John did. And then John came in probably not long after. And so they just kind of spent the afternoon actually shooting guns in the backyard, blowing off steam and which sounds like was pretty I think common. Ryan was just kind of, yeah. And actually, it talks about later that when the shots are fired, the neighbors actually didn't think much about it because it wasn't common to hear. And right. yeah. So it, it was normal. You know, and I think Ryan was just kind of venting. Right. Yeah. Getting things off his chest. It's my understanding uh, through third parties that uh, they spent time together shooting. Uh, guns uh, and uh, just uh, uh, talking and just spending time with each other. Just trying to kind of get his mind off everything. Yeah. And then at some point while they're there, two employees that worked for John come in with one of the business trucks and drop it off over at John and Tina's. So Ryan and John leave to take the employees to one of their homes and drops them off. And then they stop at the Piggly Wiggly, the local Piggly Wiggly, and come back. So all of this happens, you know, we say Ryan gets there around four. All of this is happening within a span of about four hours. And so the time isn't like, it's not super duper clear exactly, you know, when all of this like takes place as far as this in-between area. But these things happen, you know, within about the span of four hours. Yeah. By the time they get back, this is in November, so it's probably, it's dark already, probably. Yeah. I think when I looked at the weather underground, it started getting like twilight around 530-ish. Yeah. So, yeah, it was definitely getting pretty dark by the time they got back. Yeah. And so Tina actually had been in a car accident a few years prior, and a pretty severe car accident. And she had not been getting around very well and had only really recently began using a walker to get around. So Ryan and John, I think Ryan was actually getting ready to leave. And they had walked outside. You know, she called it a Southern goodbye. And, Hmm. you know, they were kind of like dragging out, you know, just talking like, oh, I got to leave. And, you know, I better go or whatever. It's like girls that can't get off the phone. They were having their long goodbyes, you know, their long southern type of uh, a bye, see you later kind of deal. And they were just out there talking. They say women like to talk. On the fateful evening of November 20th, 2015, the tranquility of Oakdale Road in Alpine was shattered. Around 8 p.m., the Talladega County Sheriff's Office received a distressing 911 call reporting shots fired. The first deputy on the scene discovered a harrowing sight, both Ryan and John lying on the ground, both suffering from gunshot wounds. A week after the murders, Tina told AL.com that she heard a man's voice asking for directions. He was on foot, not in a car, and stayed on the street. She said he just kept hanging around, asking for directions. After hearing gunshots, she saw her son's body. She did not see the gunman, but believes the shooting stemmed from a case of mistaken identity. According to AL.com, Tina thought the shooter mistook Ryan for his intended target and most likely shot John because he couldn't identify him. In September of 2019, CBS 42 featured the murders of Ryan and John on an episode of Getting Warmer. In their interview, Tina stated that she called 911 and that she told investigators a stranger walked up and began aggressively asking for directions to Truett Lane. She heard John giving specific directions right up the road. She could hear from inside where she was somebody repeating themselves, and that was actually what caused her to get up. And when she got up, she heard something going off that sounded like firecrackers. 
She glanced in the sky and saw yellow. I mean, even if I'd known it was uh, something going on out there, I wouldn't have ever dreamed that somebody would be shooting. I mean, yeah. even if it was an argument or something like that, which evidently it wasn't, I didn't hear any kind of argument. I just heard my husband just trying to tell a man how to get to where he was trying to go. Ryan was actually declared dead at the scene. John, despite being rushed to Coosa Valley Medical Center, succumbed to his injuries. And with Tina as the only witness, and her view limited, the investigation struggled to find solid leads. So in talking with Larry, I asked him, you know, did they think there was more than one person involved or, you know, whatever. And he said that all he's been told, you know, is that they've not indicated one way or the other to him whether there was more than one. But that from what he understands, they're looking at it as one person walked up and there was nothing at the scene to cause them to believe that whoever this person was ever left the roadway. Yeah, yeah. And what I take from that is that nobody reported any vehicles speeding off. Nobody passed any unfamiliar vehicles. I'm sure the deputies, I'm, it, I don't, I'm not sure how long it took them to get there, but they didn't pass anybody that, you know, seemed suspicious. Um, and then by the time they got there, but my thing too, though, is that if this is somebody walking, by the time they got there, they didn't pass anybody walking. You know, how did they get away from the scene so fast? You're right. Yeah. That just doesn't seem very plausible. No. Well, in February of 2023, a glimmer of hope emerged. A new witness came forward claiming to have seen a light-skinned black male near the scene shortly before the murders. This new information, coupled with a substantial reward of $22,500, rekindled hope that justice might finally be served. We've actually submitted a request to the Department of Forensic Sciences for copies of any records they have related to Ryan and John. Right. We're still the waiting on that. Right? Back is, you know, the standard response of we have to check with the district attorney's office to make sure it's okay to release these. Um, so we haven't gotten anything back. We haven't been denied, but we haven't gotten, you know, anything right. back either. We've also been trying to get in touch with. Sheriff Jimmy Kilgore to see if he would give us kind of a status or update right. or if there's any additional information that we could kind of provide in the episode as far as an update. Right. Um, like I think you've sent a couple of emails and I've made yeah. a couple of phone calls. <laughs> so far, we haven't been able to make that connection yet. So we are still trying to work on that. And Ryan's parents are working really hard to try to keep, you know, both Ryan and John's name out there. They would love for anybody who has any information. You know, right now, they have a lot of rumors and things that they've heard, um, a lot like most of our families do. And so, Mr. Galeri is not giving this up. No. He's determined. This is not, he's not, he's not going to let it go. If you could say anything to the person responsible, um, you know, if they're listening, what would what would you want to say to him? I would say, um, I would ask that they turn themselves in the and think of the family and the pain and the suffering that they have uh, inflicted on all of us and do the right thing. Turn yourself in. You know, if you have any information, please contact Talladega County Sheriff's Office at 256 256- 761-2141 or Crime Stoppers at 334-215-7867 or you can submit an anonymous tip via the Crime Stoppers website at 215stop.com which as always is linked in the episode description and if you have a complete aversion and are absolutely opposed to contacting law enforcement or Crime Stoppers directly you can fill out um, the contact form on our website and send your information in anonymously, and we will send it over to Talladega County Sheriff's Office. Absolutely. Um, Just get it to somebody that can get it in, 
And that's not just with their case, but with any case. There's no reason to not get that information in. Um, you know, that's one thing that we are really pushing for. Families, you know, they want answers and they deserve those answers. Amen. Since Alabama Cold Case Advocacy's creation, we have dedicated innumerable hours to researching and networking in an effort to provide the largest platform we can to the cases we share. We shoulder all associated expenses with Alabama Cold Case Advocacy out of our own pocket, including the subscription fees for researching and production of the Unforgotten podcast to provide a cost-free avenue for the victims' families of those cases. We hope you will join in our efforts to raise awareness of Alabama's missing and murdered and support these families who have been forced to carry the immeasurable loss of their loved ones and the fight for answers. If you appreciate our mission and you are inspired to make a donation, your extra support will enable the ACCA to continue our research, share the cold cases, and help those families know that they are also unforgotten. Unforgotten is an Alabama cold case advocacy podcast recorded in conjunction with Riverside FM, hosted and distributed by Spotify for podcasters, available on your favorite podcast platform. Intro music for the show was created by Principles of Uncertainty, who also mixed and mastered this episode. Content and production is by Sellers and Stormy. Artwork by Sellers. Credits for music, sound clips, special mentions, and any source referenced in our podcast can be found in each episode's description. We hope you will join us on all the major social media sites and continue to raise awareness of our Alabama cold cases. Until next time, thank you for listening, and remember, justice may be delayed, but the victims and their families remain unforgotten.